So, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us for the latest edition of Humans at Work, HGO's webinar series. My name is Miles Husett and I'm the marketing coordinator here at HGO. Today we are joined by Drs. Karen Carlson and Mike Starbird. Dr. Carlson is a professor of psychology here at UT and Dr. Starbird is a professor of mathematics also at UT. Today they lead one of HDO's most popular one-day seminars flourishing in the workplace. Today, Drs. Carlson and Starbird are here to provide an overview of their course, which is designed to provide practical <laughs> strategies to address challenges and enhance satisfaction for participants and their organizations. Professor Carlson will provide an introduction to the field of positive psychology or the science of well-being and its relevance to the workplace settings, while Dr. Starbird will discuss strategies of effective thinking to become a more creative problem solver. A few notes before we get started. Please mute your microphone and turn off your video during the professor's presentation. If you have any pressing issues or questions during the session, feel free to send any HDO staff member a private chat. That will be Alex or myself. At the conclusion of the presentation, it will be approximately 15 minutes for Q&A. Um, I'll now turn things over to Mike and Karen. I hope you enjoy the session. Thank you, Miles. Uh, so, Mike, should I get started? We actually have discussed this and have a plan in place. So, shall I, in, shall I begin? No, I want to first introduce you. So, uh, Dr. Carlson, as you heard, is a professor of psychology. The, uh, we've known each other for decades, but uh, one of the things that she does is to teach a course in po positive psychology, which is a course that she'll get uh, rave reviews from every student who takes the course, including a statement which I completely agree with, which I saw in one of her teaching evaluations, which was every student at the university should take this course because it tells people how to actually uh, get satisfaction in life in a practical way. So it's a wonderful course and, and I'm just delighted to be able to, to work with her on this uh, flourishing in the workplace seminar. Thank you, Mike. So I will say then a few words about Mike. Um, as he said, we've known each other for decades since I came to UT. And um, he uh, is wonderful uh, professor, uh, writer, uh, teacher. I always tell my students because he gets lectures in my class every semester. He's won just about, I think, every teaching award at the University of Texas and some external to the University of Texas. Um, and he, as I said, he gets lectures in my class every year. And um, he always comes in early and learns all the students' names just to intimidate. It's a small class, 18 students. I mean, it takes me about half a semester to get to know them. So he always comes early to, to do that. So if any of you take our seminar, Dr. Starbird will know your names by the end of the first five or 10 minutes as a little added bonus. So I'm also pleased to be doing this uh, with him. So let me begin. Um, oops, wait a minute. Okay, guys, this isn't good. How come it won't move? Okay, I don't know what happened. But anyway, um, I thought I'd go through an outline of what we typically would cover in our seminar. Um, and I will start with um, a positive psychology uh, perspective and tell you a little bit about what positive psychology is. Um, we then, um, I present data uh, to convince you that it's a good thing to be happy. Um, and then we'll also present some general data about happiness at work and what um, we know from a number of surveys, annual surveys about um, American workers and their work satisfaction. And then a sort of theme that both of us um, share is this idea of being able to increase happiness at work and in particular finding work as a calling. So we'll talk about what that is and how can we move in the direction, um, I would say both employees individual individually finding ways to bring a sense of calling to their work and then also employers creating um, the circumstances to help their employees feel that kind of engagement. Um, and so I cover um, specific uh, practices uh, that we hope will lead you along this path, such as cultivating relationships, identifying and using character strengths, increasing positive emotion, encouraging flow, and then developing strengths of effective thinking uh, Dr. Starbird will cover, and I did forget to mention in the introduction that he's wrote a wonderful book um, called Five Elements of Effective Thinking um, that he will cover, and I think I have a, a, at least a picture of that to show you all um, at the end. I know the participants um, in our uh, seminar receive a copy of that. 
Um, so this is an outline of the material, but I also wanted to let you know that we really enjoy having interaction. And so lots of discussions that we have some kind of small group breakout groups that we've done um, to uh, think about ways to apply the material pre we're presenting to your specific workplace. And we ask people to come in ready to talk about some maybe difficult situations at their workplace and um, really want this to be practical and uh, help people come up with ways to address those. Um, Okay. And, and by the way, let me just add that it's in the workplace and also in their uh, home lives and their other personal lives. Yes. Um, so just briefly, um, the field of positive psychology was named in 1988 as an initiative of Martin Seligman in his capacity as a president of the American Psychological Association. Um, and in his presidential address, he called on our field to use its sort of increasingly powerful and sophisticated research methods to address the way we could make the lives of all people more productive and fulfilling and satisfying. Um, and he pointed out this, that in fact, since World War II, American psychology in particular had focused almost exclusively on mental health disorders. And that definitely has been a good thing. We know far more about these kinds of uh, problems and we've helped many lives of, of people and their families uh, be better with that work. Um, and so, although the focus on happiness is not new, I always like to say Aristotle did write a book about it. Uh, what specifically characterizes positive psychology is the use of science to address these seemingly ephemeral questions that have been previously within mostly the domains of theology, uh, philosophy, and self-help. And I really like, um, yeah, I don't know. I really like this definition of positive psychology by Chris Peterson, who is one of the um, main uh, earlier contributors to the field. Um, and I will uh, go ahead and let you read it, but I think it's, um, again, a kind of poetic way of thinking about what we can do with positive psychology. And it really, um, to give you a little bit of my background, I actually, for almost all my career, um, was a researcher uh, looking at ADHD in children. And then for a number of reasons, I was kind of shifting away from that. And around the time that uh, this, uh, again, Seligman named the field, I found myself reading voraciously about um, the literature and finding it so compelling. And um, in particular, uh, I read an article, a chapter by Dr. Seligman about teaching a class on positive psychology. And I remember lamenting to a colleague, oh, that sounds so great. I wish someone at UT taught the class. And he said, well, why don't you teach it? And I, because we do have the best job in the world as professors and so much freedom. So I said, yeah, you're right. I could teach that. So uh, I spent a year or so reading everything I could in the field. I've now taught um, graduate and undergraduate seminars, and I, I call my class Positive Psychology and the Good Life. Um, I mentioned earlier I keep the class really small. It's 18 students, so um, it's hard to get into, and what I hadn't anticipated was it's almost all graduating senior psychology majors who are in the class, and it's just been so meaningful to be able to talk to these students at this incredibly important transition in their lives about what matters and what doesn't and how science can inform those decisions. I feel really um, grateful for that. Um, so I always like to let people know that positive psychology is not happyology. Um, it's not a positive psychologist running around and telling everyone they should be as happy as they can every single minute of the day. And in fact, um, as you might imagine, one of the first challenges we have to this field is, well, what is happiness? Because to have a science, you can't um, study something scientifically if you uh, can't measure it. So I'm gonna talk about um, what we think of in my field as being uh, kind of, when we talk about the good life, what we're talking about. Um, and, and so I've used happiness and happy in this, um, uh, discussion. And in fact, when people ask me what I do, I say I'm, I study the science of happiness. But that's sort of a short uh, tag term uh, for, again, this, this uh, more comprehensive construct. Um, so Ed Diener um, came up with this term subjective well-being. And it recognizes two components, 
um, of, uh, again, this kind of theme of the good life. And the first is our moment to moment emotions. And that's what most people think of when they think about happiness. So this is sort of what is your affective life as you go, out, go throughout your day. Um, and thinking about experiencing relatively high levels of positive emotions, such as joy, contentment, admiration, satisfaction, um, and relatively low levels of negative emotions, such as anxiety, um, fear, guilt. Um, and I always, again, note here, not zero levels of negative emotion. We've become increasingly aware of the importance of negative emotion. Um, for example, uh, not achieving a goal may feel really painful in the moment, but it's also feedback about uh, that can motivate us to improve. Um, having um, a, being criticized by um, a loved one can feel very again painful in the moment, but can also lead to insight and the kind of feedback that can improve the quality um, of the relationship. And I know Dr. Starbird in particular is going to talk about failure um, and the value of failure, potential value of failure. And in fact, we find that even people who experience sometimes traumatic events can find ways to uh, use that to um, bring about um, insight, meaning, uh, resilience, and sometimes even growth. So we're not talking about no negative emotion, but just mostly positive emotion. Um, and then the second component is uh, life satisfaction. And so again, when we think about what makes for a good life, we're not only talking about having happy moments as we experience our day, but also there's a cognitive component. We sit back and we reflect about our life and how it's going. Um, and so with life satisfaction, we're talking about just being generally satisfied with one's life, um, feeling like we're doing well in the areas that are important to us, such as um, our health, our work, our relationships. And then again, expanding it, having a sense of worth, um, achievement and fulfillment. And so more of a sense of meaning uh, being brought to um, kind of fill out what we think of when we're talking about well-being and a good life. Um, I'm not going to talk about this a lot. I do in my um, uh, in the full seminar, uh, but I think before trying to convince people that it would be um, uh, productive to become happier in their lives and work, we just have to step back first and say, well, is it a good thing to be happy? Um, and again, the shortcut answer is yes. And I'll show a lot more data about this, but just in terms of workplace, here are some of the areas that we've seen where workers, people um, who report being happier in their work have all kinds of benefits. Um, you can read the list there, but your supervisors rate them as performing more highly. Their overall performance and productivity is higher. Um, and then, and again, I'll talk about the specific data. We actually have in, uh, data now showing that happier workers have higher incomes. So I'm going to introduce this model, um, and this is Seligman's model um, for, well, what are the components? How do we get there? How do we get to that place of well-being? And so this is the PERMA model, and he identifies these five components of well-being. Um, and so, as I already mentioned, positive emotions, so feeling good, is one of these sort of building blocks to, to a good life. Um, also engagement, so being fully involved in what we're doing on a day-to-day -day basis, and that includes finding flow, which I am, I hope I have time to at least say a few things about, um, because this is one of the topics that we address that people find particularly um, uh, compelling. Um, oh, so flow is this feeling of being fully engaged and immersed in what you're doing at, at a moment. Um, then the third, component relationships, so having authentic connections with other people. Um, in fact, when people say to me, oh, you study happiness, what is the secret to happiness? There's a very simple answer, and that is it's all about relationships. And so having these real authentic connections with other people um, is critical for our well-being. It doesn't have to be a large number of people. For some it is, for others it's small, but having these really authentic connections. Um, Finding meaning in life, again, um, purposeful existence. So moving beyond just feeling kind of positive affect and happiness in the moment, but um, finding ways to uh, bring this sense of importance to our life. Uh, people can find meaning in deep relationships. They can find meaning in, in their work, um, something larger than themselves. It can be religion um, or again, contributing to making the world a better place. So volunteering and working um, for causes that you find important. And then this final component um, is achievement. So a sense of accomplishment, and this is where work 
um, really for all of these, but in particular here, uh, setting goals, having goals, striving towards those goals and achieving those goals is kind of a, another um, component of the, the well-being um, model of Seligman. And so, again, I mentioned before, and I want to talk about this sense of work as a calling, because this is where both Michael and I feel so strongly that we can, um, again, help people to think more about how they can find their work to feel like a calling. Um, so in surveys that are done, and there are different terms for this, some of it's just being fully engaged in your work, um, about 25 to 30% of people report um, being in this category of finding that their work is a calling. And these are people who feel like their motivation is that they're really contributing. Um, you think about the job even when you're not there, um, working hard because the job is rewarding. Some people will say, you know what, even if I get, didn't get paid for this, I would go to work. Um, and so this uh, feeling, again, of being so connected to your work that it's an important part of yourself um, is um, behind this. And so what is it that um, sets the stage for your feeling like your work is a calling or you're, that you're fully engaged in it? And the three components that we uh, will address is one is enjoying the work, something where on a day-to-day -day basis, most of the time you're there, you like what you're doing. Um, being good at the work, it's hard to find, uh, consider work as a calling if it's something you're not very good at. And then believing the work stands for something and makes a difference. Um, I won't have time to talk about this today, but in the seminar, what I first found really compelling about this is you would think from hearing this, oh, well, all professors must feel that their work is a calling. And, you know, people who are doing more low level menial type tasks probably don't feel that their work is a calling. But in fact, you can find across the range of professions, people who have found a way to make their work feel meaningful. And uh, again, that's what we're, we're addressing in our seminar. Um, I've already discussed this, and I think I'm getting close to um, being out of time. So I just want to spend the last three minutes that I have talking about flow, which is, again, a topic that we'll cover in a lot more detail um, in the seminar. Um, but flow is something that probably most, probably all of you have experienced. You might not have used this term for it. Um, but another way that people have talked about it is like, uh, like being in the moment or um, kind of being in the groove. Um, and this is sort of the state of experience where you're completely engaged in what you're doing. You're fully immersed in it. Um, people report feeling focused, completely absorbed, um, feeling success in what they're doing and enjoyment in the process of the activity. So again, really related to that feeling of being in the moment even apart from whatever the um, uh, um, actual outcome is. And the person who kind of originally uh, wrote about this and identified it is a Hungarian psychologist called Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Um, I always do like to brag, you know that I am a bona fide positive psychologist because I did pronounce that correctly and believe me, it took a lot of practice. Um, but that is correct, and, and he has written about this idea of finding flow, um, a number of books now, and including, um, I don't think you can see it very well, but this um, one called Good Business, where he talks about applying these um, principles of flow to, uh, to business and the workplace. Um, so uh, just in brief, um, Chick sent me high, again, was in Hungary, and he was very compelled um, and struck by the experiences of people um, pre and post World War II. Um, and both through his own experiences of talking to people and then in, in subsequently interviewing POWs, what he was struck by was this vast range of responses that people had. And so for some people, again, we're talking about devastating circumstances. Um, uh, you, know, a, you know, loss of your identity, your family, um, you know, the incredible kind of blow that was just, you would imagine, almost impossible to get by for most people. He found that a small number of people, despite that circumstance, found a way to um, still have meaning in their lives. And so he was so interested in this, interviewing a lot of people, and he identified a couple of um, consistent um, uh, characteristics. And one was um, feeling uh, that you're able to get a sense of reinforcement from internal sources, so doing something for the sake of doing it. 
um, and then being able to be really involved with um, what's going on at the moment. And so he ended up coming to the United States for graduate school at the University of Chicago and did work on his dissertation on the creative process for painters. He actually had been a painter at one point. Um, and he interviewed hundreds of people, uh, thousands, um, and he found that for painters, when the painting was going well, the artist would persist single-mindedly with there's a disregard for hunger, fatigue, discomfort, time goes by, fully engaged and immersed. And so this was where he came up with this term of intrinsically motivated or autotelic, aut aut worth doing for its own sake. So engaging in an action um, because in and of itself it's rewarding. Um, there are, um, when he did his dissertation, he, he interviewed, again, thousands of people, and he found this state described by dancers, chess players, uh, surgeons, pilots, and in fact, as he continued to do research later, he found this was almost universally experienced, albeit in different realms, um, in very diverse groups. I love this. He actually also studied um, uh, elderly Korean women, Japanese teenage motorcycle gang members, uh, Navajo shepherds, uh, assembly line workers in Chicago. So again, this kind of universal feeling um, of complete engagement in what you're doing. Um, there are eight elements of flow um, that he talks about that I won't uh, have time to identify here, but um, the primary aspect of flow is having a match between your skill level and what is demanded by the environment. So you get flow when the environment is very challenging, again, for a rock climber, a very difficult uh, climb, but your skill level is right at the ability to be able to meet that uh, um, level that's required. So again, we'll talk in our seminar about how to apply some of these principles of flow uh, to uh, create that in the workplace um, because um, there's been research showing that people who report feeling flow at work um, have a lot of positive outcomes. They're more productive, innovative, um, and feel like they've had more employee development. Um, so again, we'll talk about ways to increase that. Now, I think my time is up. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Mike. I did want to um, show this is his book, The Five Elements of Effective Thinking. And um, Mike, do you want me to, to just, do you want to just go fully on screen now or do you want me to leave one of these slides up? Well, why don't you just leave one of those up and I'll, I'll uh, okay. I don't think people want right. to look at me that big. <laughs> I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> that may be frightening to people. I'm not sure. It will. We don't want to scare them. It, it's such a pleasure to uh, talk about these issues with Dr. Carlson because they really are focusing on how a, an individual human being can have a different life experience. To me, one of, the, one of the joys of life is that we are creatures under creation throughout our lives. We're actually becoming different people as time goes on and we can choose to some extent how our future being is going to become. And to me, that is such a, a powerful and, um, uh, you know, exhilarating possibility that we can make choices that make a difference. When I began to think about more brother, you know, I'm the, uh, as, as Dr. Carlson said, I'm a professor of mathematics, but I don't describe myself as teaching mathematics anymore. When I was a kid, I did. I, they'd say, well, what do you teach? I teach mathematics. Now I say, I teach people how to think. I teach people the joy of thinking. I teach people how to come up with new ideas. I, uh, one of, the, one of the, the themes that I try to, to, to discuss is the idea that every one of us can come up with creative ideas and new insights into everything that we do. It's not magic. Uh, some people think of creativity as sort of magical inspiration. You know, that's the sort of uh, Hollywood view of creativity. You sit there and a brilliant idea comes to you and you, you come. Well, <clears throat> there are two defects with that view. The first defect is that it's wrong. <laughs> that's, that's not where creative ideas come from. It's simply wrong. 
And the second defect of the view that cre creative coming up with new ideas is a matter of magical inspiration, the second defect with that view is that it's useless. If you think that it's magic and that only things just sort of appear to you, there's no action you can take to come up with new ideas. And so my view is that you can, you personally, can come up with new ideas and new insights by intent, by turning your mind in particular ways, you can personally come up with new ideas. And that's what my part of this, of this course and the Five Elements of Effective Thinking book is about. What are these ideas? They're very practical. And, and I'll tell you where it evolved from in my own, my own being is that uh, when I, I was asked by a friend of mine to teach a course for liberal arts students, and this was now 30 years ago, which is astounding. But 30 years ago, I was asked by Betty Sue Flowers. Some of you may even have known her. She was a, a wonderful uh, uh, poet and professor in the English department. And, and uh, she asked me to, to create this course for these uh, wonderful liberal arts students. And I have a life policy that whenever a friend asks me to do something, I say yes. You know, this has got me into all kinds of trouble over the years, but, but also all wonderful, wonderful things as well. So in this case, I was asked to create a course that would be a math course because the mathematics course for the program that she was director of at that time was, uh, had two defects. One, it was boring, and the other is that it was useless. And so those <laughs> two little defects over the math course, she decided, well, maybe we can do better. So she formed a committee and I was on the committee. And so the outcome of the committee was that I was asked to create this course. Well, boy, I failed at this course three times. I tried to create it three years in a row and it was just a failure. You know, it just didn't work out. And then, um, but finally, finally it dawned on me that I shouldn't be thinking about teaching mathematics. I should be thinking about, can I teach people to be smarter than they are? Can I teach my, these students, these wonderful liberal arts students, can I teach things that would be valuable for them every day of their lives? Not just a little math that they could use occasionally if they're buying a house or something. Is there, are there things I could contribute that would change the way they think? the way they can solve problems in the lives they personally will lead. Can I make them better writers, better poets, better politicians, better citizens of the world? And when I shifted my view of what the real question was, it changed everything. It changed what the content of the course should be. It changed how it is I wanted to interact with the students, what I wanted them to do, how I wanted them to discover ideas for themselves not me just telling them things. And, and that, that changed the whole philosophy of the course. And it caused me to have to really come to grips with this question. Namely, can I actually teach people to be, be able to solve challenges in their lives that they could not otherwise solve? And, 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 the, and the way that uh, the outcome was that Finally, after years, by the way, of, it's sort of embarrassing how long it took for me to get progress, and I'm still making progress on this, by the way, is to identify specific strategies, practices of mind that will inevitably lead to new ideas and new insights, to creative solutions to problems. It's not magic. And then, and, and my co-author, Ed Berger, and I, you know, really focused on this for years, and we came up with a, a collection of, of five particular strategies that you can personally adopt, and that if you do, you can, you will automatically come up with, with wonderful new ideas. So, um, so I, in the remaining uh, 10 minutes that I'm going to be talking here before we uh, uh, ask for questions, I, I'm going to tell you these five strategies of thinking. And, and, uh, and hopefully they, they'll give you just a hint, you know, plant a seed that can, can flourish in your own lives. So the first one is to focus on fundamentals, to understand simple things deeply. This, what this means is to go back to the very beginning of areas in which you are the most expert and repeatedly return to fundamentals in order to see them. 
uh, more uh, to see the most advanced things more deeply. And I'll give you I'll give you an example. This is a story I always tell, which is I I, I really uh, love it. It's a story about a friend of mine who was uh, one of the greatest trumpet players in the in the world. He's uh, his name's Tony Plogue, and he lives in Germany. Well, the University of Texas at Austin Music School is a great school, and they invited him to come and give a master class in trumpet performance. And uh, he came and stayed at my house. And I, I said, I don't know what a master class is. And he said, well, why don't you just come along? So I went to this master class. And the master class was really what it is, for those of you who don't know, it's, uh, it's really private lessons, but with an audience of other people watching the private lesson. So there were about 20 people in the room, trumpet professors and graduate students in trumpet performance. And these were wonderful trumpet players, all of them. And they introduced Tony, who was a famous, world famous person. And he said, who's the first performer? And so some guy, maybe Bob, comes down and uh, my friend Tony says, well, what are you going to play for us today? And Bob says, well, I'm going to play the third movement of the Rachmaninoff, some, you know, some fancy thing. And he proceeds to play, and he's an excellent trumpet player because he's a PhD student at the University of Texas. He plays, you know, very fancy kind of a virtuosic passage. And after a few minutes, just two minutes or something, my friend Tony said, oh, well, very good. Now let me give you some pointers about how to make it even better, as you'd expect. He went through the entire lesson helping and the guy would play and then he'd go back and forth. At the end of the lesson, Tony said, well, um, how long do you spend practicing the exercises? And old Bob says, well, uh, young Bob says, well, I, I just practice five or 10 minutes to warm up and then I practice my repertoire, which you practice several hours a day, of course. And uh, Tony said, well, you might spend more time practicing the exercises. Well, the same thing happened to three people came down, played virtuosic stuff, had a lesson, and then at the end, Tony would ask, how much time do you spend exercise? They said, five or 10 minutes, he said, you might spend more time. Didn't make a big deal of it. At the end of the time, there were four people involved. He said, um, are there any questions? Well, I was the only one in the room who didn't know anything about the trumpet, but I always have questions. That's one of the elements of effective thinking, to raise questions, think of questions. So I raised my hand and he looked at me and said, Mike, you know, what are you doing <laughs> interrupting? You know, you don't know anything about the trumpet. I said, Tony, why did you, these were wonderful trumpet players. Why did you tell all of them to spend more time on the exercises? And he said, well, I'll show you. And he asked the first person to come down, Bob. And he said, would you play the exercise? And Bob said, sure. Well, we'd only heard virtuosic passages up to now. Now Bob played da, 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 some simple thing. You know, it sounded like a scale, very childish sounding. And then Tony, my friend Tony said, oh, uh, okay, uh, could I borrow your trumpet? And uh, I was thinking to myself, you know, he hadn't played anything up to now. Could I borrow your trumpet to Bob? And Bob said, sure. And, and I'm thinking to myself, Tony, you're giving a trumpet lesson. Bring a trumpet. You know, it's, it seems sort of basic to me. You want to bring a trumpet? Apparently I hadn't thought of that. So anyway, he did have his own mouthpiece for those of you who believe in germs. He, and, and then he proceeded to play, and the first time he hadn't played before, he played that exercise. But when he played it, it was gorgeous. Every note rang like a bell. The little phrasing da, 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 was gorgeous. You would pay money to hear him play that exercise. It was beautiful. And it was clear that the difference between the actual international virtuoso and this wonderfully talented graduate student occurred at the production of the basic sounds. And Tony explained it, he said, look, if you get to be able to produce sounds with great efficiency and great control and nuance, that's what's going to lead you to be able to play the most advanced parts of your repertoire with, with distinction and nuance. It's not that you just practice element elementary parts, it's that every time you advance, you revisit basics. To me, it's a question in, in the case of an academic subject, revisit the fundamentals of the subject. They become richer, they become foundational. You'll see nuances that you didn't see when you first learned them. If you're in a company, what is the basic feature of that company? What's its goal? That kind of reflection causes you to see the most advanced, 
work that you have in a different light. So that is one of the strategies of effective thinking, to return to fundamentals frequently. I think it's true also for relationships. Dr. Carlson said the importance of relationships. How about taking the people you know best and going back to fundamentals, do you actually know about their own histories, their own preferences, their own strengths? One of the things Dr. Carlson didn't talk about, but we talk about a lot during the course is strengths. What are your personal strengths that you bring and can you explore them more and see what effect they can have? So this is another, another issue, understand people better. Well, okay, I better hurry up because I've got just a couple minutes to do the remaining four, which is a typical for my strategy. Very typical. Uh, so the next one is make mistakes. Fail to succeed. It's a double entendre, you know, fail to succeed. Learn from mistakes. It's not the mistakes themselves that are useful. It's not mistakes that are useful. It's learning from the mistakes. And what does that mean? I'll give you just a practical example. I, I was doing this in a, in a class where I was talking about mistakes and a, a student, it was a math class, but a student came up afterwards and said, oh, I wanna thank you for, for this lesson. I said, well, why? She said, well, I, I have been trying to write a paper in my history class and I haven't been able to do it at all, but now I know exactly what to do. And I said, oh, well, that's interesting because I hadn't been talking about history. And she said, she said, yeah, I know exactly what to do. I'm going to go home and write a bad paper. Right, that's correct, that's exactly right. If you want to write a good thing, a good start is to write something bad. And then what do you do? Look for all of the things that actually are great, where you picked the correct word, your logic was great, your evidence was strong. That's great, keep those. But then when you make mistakes, don't just cross them out and ignore them and throw them away. Every mistake is a jewel. It's guiding you. It's telling you what needs to be changed. The mistake allows you to change from trying to come up with a good idea to fixing a specific defect. If you've written something and that sentence just doesn't read right, well, maybe it's because the evidence is weak. And if you say, ah, oh, I see why that's not strong because I don't have the evidence. Oh, I didn't use the right word. It doesn't mean exactly what I intended to convey. You, by looking at the specific mistakes, and focusing on them, they are directive. They are, are gems of guidance for you. So don't waste mistakes. Uh, embrace them and exploit them. That's a great thing. Okay, well, in any case, we're, uh, I'm about out of my time, so I will quickly do uh, just one more, one more thing, which is um, a view of life itself, I think, as uh, something that's continually evolving. Everything, it, whether it's your professional life or your personal life, it's always changing. It's not fixed. And I think if you think of yourself as under construction, it really is useful. And I'll give you a little metaphor. The University of Texas has over 200 buildings in it. And if you've ever been to UT or are familiar with it, one thing that is a little bit annoying is that you'll find that there are always road closures and cranes and dust and this. There's always something going on, a building's being built. Well, think about it. If you have 200 buildings and a building lasts, say, 50 years before it needs to be torn down and rebuilt or a big renovation, that's about right. Well, that means if you've got 200 buildings, on average, four buildings a year are going to be starting a major renov renovation or being torn down. That means that the norm of the reality is under construction. It's not the norm that everything is working great. And think of your own life. Think of all of the features of your life, your health, your, your, your relationships, your professional life, your academic life, your other interests. Think of all of the things you're involved in. It's not the norm that everything is perfect. That's not the norm. The norm is that some of those things are under construction. And if you embrace that, not only as reality, which it is, whether you embrace it or not, but if you embrace it, you have a different sense of things. You're not under the stress of saying, oh, something is going wrong. Yeah, it is. Something's always going wrong. 
And then that's, uh, and, and it's not that they're going to get necessarily, everything's going to improve all the time, but embracing the idea that this is part of the way life is, how it unfolds for all of us. I think it makes it less stressful and more uh, healthy in your, in viewing things in a more positive and realistic way. In any case, all of these themes are just seeds. They are helping, and, and both Dr. Carlson and I view the take, take home lessons from this course and, and indeed from much more than just this course to be seeds that you can use to enhance your own uh, ability to navigate your life as, as you know it, your personal life and your professional life. And those things I think are, are, are really one of the, really the core of the joy of being a human being. So maybe now, uh, now we should ask for some questions. Is that right, uh, Dr. Carlson? Or I think so. Questions? So um, Miles, I'm going to stop the screen, the sharing mode. Okay. Uh, so there we are. Um, so let's see, you're, uh, do you all sort of uh, take the questions? Yeah, if, if everyone <clears throat> questions, if you just want to put it in the um, chat box, um, Drs. Carlson and Starbird can answer them that way. Um, that way we don't have people talking over each other since there are quite a few of us in this, uh, in the webinar. Great, I look forward to, to some great questions. So this is, they're supposed to type in the chat box, is that correct, Miles? Yes, correct. Okay. Okay, well, we'll look forward to questions. And, um, and by the way, while, while I'm waiting, while we're waiting for the first question, let me just say something about questions. W one of the themes of effective thinking is raise questions. And one of the most fundamental questions that I think needs to be raised is, what is the real question? What is the real question, say, in life? You know, a lot of people I, I find very poignant and rather sad is that many people spend their lives pursuing the wrong question. They may try to get rich when they really want the kind of life satisfaction that uh, that that we're talking about in this in this seminar. And and so it's uh, asking what is the real question is great. Let's just see if we have a question here. <clears throat> Uh, here we have a question. Did you see this question from uh, Diane Flores? Um, I think you need to read it to me, Mike. I'm not sure how to do that part. Okay, I'll read it to you. Here's the question. What is the benefit of getting someone engaged in their current work versus encouraging them to find what they are called for or to call to? Do you, do you want to talk about that? Or we can both talk about it. Why don't yeah, you yeah, I can start. I think that's a great question because um, one of the things I talk about in my class and a little bit in the seminar is the importance of goals, just goal setting. And um, there's always a kind of tricky line between saying, I need to just keep working harder at this goal, or maybe this just isn't the right goal for me. And the ability to disengage from a goal and re-engage in a new goal is also a skill that can be important. And I think um, it's a great question because I I think people can make mistakes on either side of that. I think sometimes people don't persist when a little bit extra work would, again, maybe they could make what they have now into something engaging. But I also see students many times, some of my graduate students even, who they had this idea in their mind, I have to be this, I have to get, I have to be a doctor, I have to be a lawyer. And it may not be what's really, again, in their heart of hearts, what would be the most meaningful. Mm -hmm. And yet either parental messages or society is sort of, made this into a program. And so then this, the skill is disengaging from that um, and, and finding something else. And I, I think it's such a great question, but not an easy formula for an answer. Um, I think it's a lot of soul searching. What do you want to add to that, Mike? Yeah, I, I want to add two things to it. One is that I think it's not an either or. I think you can find the richest possible uh, reaction and relationship to whatever it is you're doing at the moment, while at the same time realizing that you are a work in progress and that you can see other opportunities as they arise and, and, and be willing and happy to go ahead and try those as well. So I don't think that you have to say, oh, I'm going to, you know, just cut off everything I have now. 
but instead say, okay, can I make this richer? And I think that will open you to opportunities all around you. I, I sometimes think of, 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 of life in this way, and I, I don't know, uh, Karen, you can tell me if you <laughs> disagree with this, you may not have heard this before, but I sometimes think of, of us as walking around in a sort of a fog, that we're in a fog and opportunities are just outside. And sometimes we can see them somewhat vaguely. And if we just swash away the, the fog for a minute, suddenly they become clearer and we can go ahead and pursue them. That, that to me, being open to opportunities, if you are open to opportunities, then that's great. And, but the happier you are where you are is actually an enhancement to being able to change. It's not, it's not that you've got to really make sure you're miserable before you go on to the next thing. The second thing I wanted to say about this is I don't believe that people are born to be one thing or born to be another. I think that you develop into all kinds of possibilities. Each of us could have become many different things. And, it's, and, and so, so I, I, I think it's not a good idea to, to imagine that there is some sort of uh, platonic ideal you and oh, I want to pursue that and find it. It's not finding, it's creating. You're creating yourself. Okay, uh, sh shall we go on to the next question? Yes, yes. Okay, the next question. Um, uh, let's see, how, how do you get people to start thinking about self-reflection if they've never done it before? Hmm, I, I feel like I'm self-reflecting right now, but <laughs> hopefully I have done it before. Uh, do you have something to say about this, Mike? Well, yes, I, and, what it, and it is what you do in your class. You ask people to do things like, what are my strengths and where have I I've demonstrated those strengths most clearly? So maybe you want to talk just a, a minute about that. Yeah, I didn't talk a lot about that. Um, um, in the seminar, we have people actually take an online test before coming to the class that identifies character <clears throat> strengths, and we work with those a lot. And that is a great exercise for, as you're saying, kind of self-awareness. Um, and I always have, again, it's hard to, in a short period of time, do justice to it. But this strength um, survey that was developed by uh, Seligman and Peterson has 24 character strengths. They range from wisdom, creativity, uh, curiosity, wisdom. Um, it's always um, one of my first exercises in the class is to have the students take it and come back and tell a story about a time they used a strength. And one of the, which is always just very powerful, but uh, what sometimes happens is students will say, I was shocked when X came up as one of my strengths. And then as they self reflect on it, and they do a lot of work around strengths and look at research and write essays and talk about personal experiences, they come to be much more aware of how it may be that they have, uh, again, this sort of strength. And, and, uh, I even advocate this as an, in, um, as an exercise that can be done uh, at the workplace as a sort of staff kind of uh, exercise, employee development sort of thing. And I've led those kinds of discussions in groups and had it be powerful. So I guess that um, is one kind of specific way of thinking about that question. In fact, did, didn't you tell me that you had people talk to their, for example, grandparents, your, your students and so on yes. with a strength test? Yeah. So that's when it so yeah, when you talked about knowing people better, um, one of their optional exercises is to have a family member take this strength survey and um, it's uh, and then interview them based on the results. And very often students will say, I had no idea, like they're they're surprised at what they learn is someone who's they've known all their lives, literally. Um, and they'll learn things and, and I ask them to have their parent tell a story and they'll learn something that they didn't know that can be just, you know, so impressive and, and moving. And again, that sort of sense of how could I have not known this about the person, but we don't, we don't tend to yeah, continue well, that process. Well, in, in the case of people who are parents and have children, of course, one of the challenges is that we need to continually re-meet our own children as they grow because they become different people. And that's one of the challenges of, of not only parenthood, but all other relationships, you know, marriages and, and, and relations with parents and siblings and so on. 
that, that as people change, re-meeting people is very healthy. Uh, um, Mike, I think I saw uh, a question come up about the strength survey. So I did want to at least let people know about that. Ah, good. Um, so again, this is a, there are a number of different strengths finders, uh, some specific to the workplace. The one that I, I use is about character strengths and virtues um, that was developed by um, Seligman and Peterson. But their website is Authentic Happiness, all one word, AuthenticHappiness.com. And it's a great resource in general, but one of the things they have there, and it's free, um, is the character strength survey, and it's called VIA, Values in Action, Character Strengths and Virtues. So AuthenticHappiness.com, VIA, Character Strengths and Virtues. Um, and you will get um, a feedback from them that actually rank orders these 24 strengths and can be, again, a great uh, tool um, for self-reflection. Right. Here's another question. Um, what is the best way to encourage people to try something new, knowing in the beginning that they won't be good at it and will make mistakes? So you should, Michael, you talk about that. So give, give, talk about your example that you give if, you, if there's time or at least what you talk about in terms of, I mean, Mike, Mike pretty much just forces them to answer questions they don't know <laughs> or to perform tasks that they can't do. So you wanna say something about that? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. It, some of it is very simple. You just ask, ask people to do it or do it yourself, by the way. Just try things that they're not good at. In my own teaching, uh, one of my styles of teaching is that I ask people to do things that, that really they can't do. I, I pose questions and challenges, and I know they're, they're, not, they're not in a position to do them completely correctly, but they can struggle with it. There's nothing more important than struggle. And if you can get people to embrace that state of mind as a positive state of mind, rather than worrying about mistakes. You see, you brought up the question of mistakes. Mistakes, if, and one of the things that I talk about in the seminar is to actually change the affect, the feeling that you personally have at a moment of a mistake or a failure. If you really embrace the correct idea that failures and missteps are actually steps toward uh, success, then you have a different internal reaction to, to a misstep or a failure. And the way I like to phrase it is, every creative advance is built on the ash heap of failed attempts. Just look historically. I mean, every big idea came from failure after failure after failure. Well, then if you, if you are in hip, if you view every misstep as, a, as something to, to, to avoid, the reality is you're never going to actually have those insights that will lead to success. So, so if you change how you view mistakes, and instead of saying, oh, I would prefer to be successful, then more successful, then more successful, then more successful, that's not, that's not really it. I've heard people who are, are CEOs of major companies who say, you know, would you rather hire somebody who has had, you know, four successes in a row and never had any setback, or a person who has had two successes and two failures? They will say, oh, I want the, I want the person who's had that experience of failure. Because if they have learned from that, if they've demonstrated that they have taken that, first of all, they're resilient, they've learned how to deal with failure, but, but learning how to deal with it is not to say, oh, it's terrible, I wish it didn't happen, but to say, what can I learn from that? And if you see that as a characteristic, then you no longer worry about failure. You no longer say, oh, it would be terrible, I might fail. No, you say, great, great, that's, that's gonna happen, and I can enjoy learning something new. And that'll be part, and it's an obvious part of begin, being a beginner, but actually, by the way, it's an obvious part of whenever you're trying to extend your skill, even beyond whatever it is now, regardless if you're a beginner or the most advanced person in the world. Yeah, Mike, that's great. And let me, let me add something to that. And you and I have discussed this at length because we have very strong ideas about education um, and especially early education, elementary education and on. But I, I think this is a great example of something that we're sort of inoculated to believe um, uh, a lot of times you know, as we're in classrooms, that we would never, ever want to make a mistake. That would be a terrible thing to do. 
and then it's also related to your idea about asking questions. It's we're we're you know been been um, I think made to feel that it's not a good thing to ask a question because that shows that you don't understand something. So I think that sort of general kind of oh you should always know everything. You should never make a mistake. Don't ask a question because that means you didn't understand something. Is just really um, has this, such a dampening effect on everything that you know you're trying to promote. Um, and that we're trying to promote again about being a sort of growing uh, person. Yeah. Um, now, by the way, do you think um, it, it's now five minutes till the end? Do we want to uh, deal with one more question or would you like to make some closing comments? And Miles, I don't know what, what the format is here for our seminar. Uh, yeah, we'll probably wrap up around uh, one, um, but I'll leave that up to you, whatever you prefer to do. If you would like to take one more, or um, if you want to go ahead and wrap up, I'll leave it, that up to you all. Okay. Well, let's see. Let, let's see here if we want to um, uh, answer another question. Let's see. You mentioned matching skill to skill required. Can you talk about this in relation to starting a new career? when you still have many skills to build to be able to get to the effective match, and how can you still find flow? Yeah, so we, start, we started to address this a little bit. Again, I think some of this has to do with really knowing yourself. It's kind of a question of, uh, you know, how do you find out about yourself? And, and I think that includes skills, which is certainly within the domain of flow, but also values um, and, uh, again, we talk about work as a calling. There's so many aspects of, of this just on a daily basis. What do you like to do? You know, do you want to be outdoors? Uh, you know, do you want to have a lot of interaction with people? Do you want to have a lot of autonomy? Um, and so I think asking yourself these questions, um, and it can include, you know, again, the self-discovery through strengths finders, the one I recommended or others, and like, what are, what are the sorts of skills that I'm already good at? And then can further development, further develop um, I will say that in, in one of the, the parts of uh, my talk, um, I think we've tended to uh, think about our skill set as something that's almost deficit oriented. So a lot of vocational tests are take this test to find out what you're bad at and then try to get better at it. And it's not that there's no value to that. There can be some value to that. But I would advocate find out what you're really good at and build on those because that's where you're much more likely to find success and enjoyment um, in what you do. Yeah, yeah, I, I completely agree with that. That if you work on your strengths, that what will happen often is that things that were perceived that you perceive to be weakness sort of is often magically disappear or become way better, not by working on them, but by working on your strengths. Because as you get better and better in your in your in your uh, your strength area, first of all, you're more apt to make fast improvement with strengths than with weaknesses. And then when you do that, you just become a more competent person altogether. It, you know, in mathematics, as you know, I'm in math thing. And what's amazing about math is that you know you struggle with things and you just barely learn something, and then you learn some completely unrelated field that really is mathematically unrelated to something that you have struggled with before. And you will discover that this other subject suddenly becomes clearer. And it's not because of specific building blocks that have, have contributed, but that you have become more facile in general, and they're a, therefore able to deal with issues that apparently were unrelated, but in fact have to do with general competence. And that, that's part of, I'd say, our theme. Well, now we only have a minute left. Uh, Karen, do you want to make a closing uh, statement? And then we'll, we'll thank everybody. Sure. I, I mean, I'll just say that I hope we get to meet some of you in person. Um, it's been fun covering sort of some of the big themes that we're going to, uh, that we discuss in our seminar. Um, and again, emphasize that both Mike and I um, are really um, committed to having this work be meaningful in a very real concrete way. So we will ask people to bring in um, thoughts about what kinds of issues they're facing at work and have opportunities to discuss very specifically how could we apply what we're learning today to address those. 
Right, and and by the way, I think this, that this uh, Zoom uh, kind of 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 format is uh, remarkably effective. I think you you I I think you know when I think about this special moment that we're all going through. To me, one of the things to do is embrace the idea that, in fact, we can learn not only the same kinds of ways that we did before, but we're adding new strategies of learning and and productive. Uh, growth that we wouldn't have expected, we wouldn't have chosen, but that by turning our minds toward uh, embracing it, we can we don't have to stop and wait until we come back to what we previously viewed as normal. Yeah, I agree. Anyway, best wishes to all of you for uh, in, enjoying your your uh, your lifelong uh, challenge and I, I would say adventure of becoming the person who you you are you're going to meet a new person and your who is yourself in the future <laughs> good way to end it okay thanks everyone yeah thanks guys uh just wanted to let everyone know that we did um, record the webinar and i will be following up shortly um, with an email with the recording um, and if you have any questions or concerns um, feel free to respond to that email but uh, thanks again for joining us we hope everyone has a great rest of your day and a great week Goodbye. Bye.